Hello everyone, and welcome to another episode of NBS Radio. A fair bit has happened since our last broadcast, which is why today we'll be bringing you another new show with a roundtable discussion, featuring my two guests at this time, Bob Arena. Hello. And Scorch. Hello. So you guys have got the three of us to uh, listen to today, and since this whole saga begun, um, it's important that we really focus as far as getting things accurately, but also, you know, speaking on them thoughtfully. So we're going to be breaking this down into a few parts, um, you know, beginning with the repeal, the recent repeal by the original assembly of the Aurora Alliance. Um, and, and I think a great starting point for us to discuss this, obviously, you know, the RA did repeal, end up voting to repeal the Aurora Alliance between TSP and TNP. And I think a great starting point for this would be, you know, the events that led up uh, both last term and this term to a sort of rising of tensions between TNP and TSP. Uh, of course, before diving into this subject, we need the important disclaimer that unless stated otherwise, uh, the views of panelists on NBS Radio are not reflective of that of the government. So what you'll be hearing from us is, of course, thoughtful commentary, but not necessarily what TNP government, uh, you know, their beliefs, what they state. But nonetheless, we will endeavor to focus on the facts, stick to that, and uh, just present you with an entertaining, hopefully informative broadcast today. Uh, the first thing I'd like to discuss, and, you know, I think especially Bob, as someone who's been around in the Ministry of WA Affairs, can really attest to, you know, we have actually the Minister of WA Affairs here in our audience, our live audience, but... Um, Really, kind of what happened last term under Hold'em in which, you know, it really started with those CNC commend and condemn proposals in the SC. And, of course, you know, there was competing interests there as far as Hold'em, um, his vote, obviously, the, the vote of the delegate is uh, very important in TSP, or in TNP, excuse me. Well, in both, in both. But, um in TNP especially, because it just commands so much power and influence as far as the number of endorsements and such. Um, Bob, if you could, did you want to sort of recount what those competing interests were? All right. So, essentially, the competing interests at hand were a couple of proposals to condemn or to commend CNC um, raiders. For example, um, I believe it was Huldum who co-authored a condemn of Tom slash Chef Big Dog. Am I correct on that? Yeah, you're correct in saying that obviously the competing interests there were proposals that TNP would obviously have a vested interest in I think the other one was Commend Eris, a.k.a. Former English Colony. Yep. And, you know, it was that as well as the Chef Big Dog proposal in which um, really T TNP kind of had to face a sort of, for, for lack of a better term, a sort of pressuring as far as, as it came out with uh, competing demands. And those competing demands, obviously, were those who uh, did want to see those proposals succeed and those who did want to see them fail. The Command Chef Big Dog proposal, it was co-authored by Vara, actually. Um, it was proposed by a, a Joe What Up, a Blood Red Moon, but it was co-authored by Vara, so you're actually incorrect in saying it was Hold'em. Uh, Vara, of course, was the co-author on that proposal, and, you know, it, it eventually came out that those um, aligned TSP and those aligned with TSP were really wanting for the delegate to vote a certain way on those. Um, and obviously, you know, if, if those sort of inclinations are at odds with our own um, leanings towards those proposals, like I said, you know, TNP is going to have a vested interest in that. Uh, you know, Scorch, you're someone who's been in and around TNP for quite a while. Um, so, you know, looking back on what happened last term and the events that kind of led up to this, what were some of your thoughts as far as, you know, what's the best way to manage those competing demands when it comes to WA votes? Yeah, I mean, um, I joined pretty much, like, I kind of came back right as it was happening. So it definitely took a 
like a week of catching up to kind of figure out what was going on in the first place. Um, but yeah, I mean, I think you got to, um, you know, you're right, those competing interests and, and looking at, uh, you know, obviously those other regions do want uh, that vote from our delegate and that's really important to them. Uh, you know, I think that balancing that uh, is, is uh, it's a definitely a, a tough thing to do. And I think obviously hold them kind of got caught up in a, in a tough spot, and I think um, obviously the uh, the Minister of Foreign Affairs. How do you pronounce his name? Is it Win Win Dong? Sorry, I, I don't remember. Women Ham. Women Ham. Most yeah. people usually say Wim. Yeah. Gotcha. Wim. Um, yeah. Nobody knows or cares enough how to say Women Ham out loud. <laughs> gotcha. So um, obviously there was a conflict there, and. He didn't feel, you know, he they just didn't feel that it was handled correctly, and um, kind of how it came to light. But uh, I'm I haven't been as involved in the WA affairs as, as you guys have uh, been, obviously, with your experience. Um, but I think we need to take our considerations uh, first and foremost. And I think that um, you know the pressure coming from the regions, while obviously important, especially ones that are we're allied to, such as TSP. Um, you definitely can't be taken advantage of, uh, which is kind of how it seemed like it was going. Again, I kind of rejoined as it was happening, so I don't want to say anything too incorrect. I don't want to speak more in general terms um, from what I know, um, but that's kind of the way it seemed to go. Yeah. Speaking from the defender's perspective sort of here, the ultimate end goal is to not have greater accommodations, condemnations, and such on the books. The, the, that is a common view in Defender SC circles. Just look at any of Quebecshire's posts, for example. Um, you'll find those themes are quite common in opposing, um, in terms of taking a hardline stance in opposing any any sort of raider commendation and or condemnation. Um, and that's kind of been a trend um, since the passing of the Aegis Accords and such. Yeah, and, you know, speaking on, you know, Scorch returning around the time that this was happening, I will, I will remark that that is a bit of an interesting phenomenon that we did see happen here in the North. Uh, as far as people realizing that there was sort of a breakdown, whether it be in communications, public perception, etc., um, and sort of kind of gravitating back to the region in a way, uh, whether it be to witness that or to, you know, add their two cents in where it was. And I think if there was going to be a sort of silver lining to this, I think it would be that, you know, some of our older community members did return, like Scorch, like Darkania. And, you know, I know Dark has specifically said before he, he wanted to see the events unfold. And I think a lot of people, you know, had the curiosity, you know, had the concern for some of these things. Because obviously, you know, the Aurora Alliance was a very long-standing alliance. It goes back to be before a lot of us were even involved in TNP, let alone in S. Um, you know, some of the older timers for TSP or in TNP, well, likewise, both can probably tell you when the alliance came about, you know, and what and what that situation was like. You know, your Elus of the world, your heiresses of the world. Um, Sanctaria, who also came back. Because yes, of exactly. Sanctaria is another one. And I will say that I think seeing these, you know, former citizens become current citizens, like present day citizens, and come back to the region, I think that that has been good for the health of TNP. I think it's great. I think it's great to have some of these guys back. Um, it, it, it's just unfortunate that these were the circumstances which caused them to return or which enticed them to want to return. And, you know, it's, it's that same kind of curiosity and concern, which is why I do want to open up this episode to questions, because I know that some citizens are not necessarily sure of the events that unfolded, or they want to have, you know, some points of clarification. And hopefully, you know, during the course of the broadcast, if we see your question, uh, we can address that, the three of us. And hopefully give you a satisfactory answer that might uh, shed some light on what's verifiably went down, um, while also, you know, offering our thoughts on what might go down in the future. But yeah, the catalyst for this event, obviously, competing, com competing demands in the WA, 
um, you know, obviously TNP is going to want to support one of their own um, as far as a command. Former English colony, I, I don't have any doubts that they were going to have a good domestic support as far as the WA votes. Uh, but Chef Big Dog was another matter, of course, you know, Radar Aligned, uh, Lone Wolves United affiliated. And yeah, so obviously there was going to be a point of contention there with uh, the Aegis Accords and stuff of that nature. Uh, I think moving further on, you know, we want to talk about not only the catalyst for this event, but we also want to talk about just generally how the situation progressed over time. So it, it, it's been remarked on in gameplay circles, there's been a rise in what has been coined neo-moralism. Of course, the old moralism being your traditional 10,000 islands sort of ideals. Um, but now, now we're seeing what uh, others in the gameplay community, you know, prominent members like Cop, like Ever Wandering Souls, have coined this sort of neo-moralist movement. There was an entire thread in GP that talked about what that term means and what it might entail. So it's been a point of discussion for the gameplay community. And I just kind of want to open the floor up to you two um, as far as your thoughts on, do you believe that the rise in neo-moralism is apparent? Do you disagree with the term neo-moralism? You know, things of that nature. Let's turn the floor over to you guys to see how you're feeling about that. I think that I think the term neo-moralism makes a ton of sense um, because it's, you're right, you are seeing an ideological drift from the original 10,000 Islands moralism, but on the same token, it's still rooted in that same ideology, i.e. eliminate rating, um, more so than to just tacitly oppose it, per se. Um, I guess those are the sort of differentiating factors between um, neo-moralism and traditional moralism, in a sense. Uh, yeah, I mean, you were talking earlier, we were on the earlier point, uh, Bob, about, um, you know, how hard line they are. And I think that was obviously a big issue and is a big issue uh, with the group as a whole is that, you know, they just, they're, it's hard to talk to people who are such hardliners on a specific issue, especially, you know, defending and rating. Um, so I think that kind of ultimately led to the conflict of interest that we were talking about earlier. And I think it's, it could continue to be a problem with the, you know, with how that said they are in the issues and how um, unwilling they are to, you know, discuss, I guess, possible alternatives to <laughs> their line of reasoning or the you know, outcomes that they want, you know, that's kind of what it seems for me as uh, someone who has returned to this, like I said, just coming back and seeing this new ideology of neo-moralism and, you know, how hard line they are about it. Yeah, and, and in my own personal experience, you know, uh, I've been both a raider and a defender. For my first year on NS, I was a defender, and then, of course, I uh, drifted over to the raider side, joined the dark side, if you will, and I've sort of been there ever since. Nowadays, I'd kind of consider myself, you know, personally a uh, raider-leaning independent, if you will, and we are going to go, we are going to get into further depth as far as, you know, fusing of different gameplay stances and what that might look like um but you know just something the hardline talking point i think that you know from from my from where i sit defending in you know those 2014 2015 even 2016 up until now over the course of the past you know five to six years or so has it's definitely a different attitude than it used to be um and i'm not necessarily saying that's better or for worse uh, but I will say that as far as the passiveness versus active resistance, it definitely is a more noticeable attribute. So before, I think as far as the traditional moralism that XKI helped pioneer, I think that was kind of contained in a way to their region and their circle, how they wanted to govern their region and how they saw fit to allow new citizens to come in and stuff like that. I think neo-moralism is sort of the evolution of that. 
in which it's more widespread as far as an ideal. And we're seeing regions uh, across the defenderist block, if you will, sort of adopt the attitude that, yes, you know, we, we, we oppose raiding, as we always have. Uh, but it's taking it's taking more expansionist and, uh, if I will say, aggressive stances towards opposing it. It used to be, you know, oh, we're going to see you on the battlefield and the tagging runs and stuff like that. I think nowadays it's extended to foreign affairs maneuvering. Of course, there was always some elements of that, but I think now more apparently so. Um, and also, it's as we we just mentioned, it's extended to the WA, politics within the WA. It's extended to sanctions. Uh, not allowing people to join events, etc., depending on what affiliation they are, what community they belong to. And I think that in the past, you know, that was really contained to XKI. And now we're seeing it's not contained to them. Um, and I think that generally, there's definitely more of a willingness for regions to go that extra mile to sort of um, uphold their beliefs in gameplay and uphold their stances as far as where um, others stand on terms of alignment. There's been statements on alignment from various regions, including the North Pacific. It's definitely been pushed to the forefront, I would say. Uh, definitely seems like a, an ends make the means kind of way of going about it, at least from what I could tell from the way they interacted uh, with us during the whole, um, during the, uh, WA politics we were discussing earlier during that whole situation. Um, so, yeah, they're definitely willing to go to a further extent uh, than they were uh, years ago. And I think that's, uh, we're seeing the effects of it now, kind of like you were saying. Yeah, and, you know, uh, I will say, like, a member of our live audience did just ask me, where's the best place to put questions about this if you guys have questions? Uh, for the live audience in attendance listening in, there is a show chat uh, attached to the stage. If you guys want to put your questions in there, we will do our best to address them as the broadcast goes on. Um, we'll, we will be able to see them there, so as long as you're able to uh, lodge messages over there, which it should be, that's a great uh, place to put your questions. But yeah, uh, just the general willingness to, I think it's it's also become more acceptable to sort of exert influence and kind of your impose. I don't want to say impose because that sort of has a negative connotation. I do want to say promote. I think promoting their beliefs, their stances, it's much more acceptable to do that in, you know, wider areas of nation states, not specifically just R&D, but also in the wider gameplay world, in the WA. Uh, you know, we see, we see sort of a soft power kind of thing, I would say. I know soft power is more of an imperialist term, and I don't want to conflate that. But I do think soft power in the sense of, like, where you're welcome as far as cultural events and things of that nature go, community events. Um, because, yeah, I think regions are very staunch in their support of, an, of a particular alignment nowadays, whereas they might have been in the past, but not necessarily as outspokenly so. We've been over sort of the Catalyst event. We've been over, I would say, what you might refer to as the rising action with neo-moralism. Um, the next thing we really kind of want to talk about is sort of leading up to the climax, another part of the rising action. Do we believe that, you know, this sort of conflict could have been foreseen? Has this been, you know, the culmination of events over a number of years, or has it really been within the last year uh, that these uh, instances have been happening that sort of led to this event to occur, you know? I personally would say that I don't think if you had told someone two years ago that this would have been the case, I don't necessarily think that they would have believed you. And the reason I don't think that they necessarily would have believed you is because two years ago, when I was delegate back in 2021, this was not a thing. Um, we had, of course, the only the only memorable, the only memorable sort of. Um, a snag in the TNP TSP relationship that I could say from back then was on quorum rating, which uh, I, as verifiably so, more than two attempts were made to solve that successfully, and it did. It did de-escalate the situation for um, uh, quite a while after the fact. You know, 
There was a time where I, as delegate and my Minister of Foreign Affairs, sat down with representatives from TSP, and we had, you know, what I would refer to as a gentleman's agreement as far as quorum rating and what our understandings of that was. And then later on in the administration of uh, both Mad Jack and Ghost, we had, you know, further attempts to sort of codify that and refine what those quorum rating terms were. But I, w I would say that prior to this, there wasn't really any any kind of bumps in the road for the TNP TSP relationship. Do you guys think that would be fair to say? There was the CCD thing, um, where people had some feelings hurt, and there were a lot of people in the forum thread that Im that stated that TNPs um, or McMasteronia specifically his statement implied that TSP's actions abetted fascism. Um, and you're right that the ultimate root cause was a fundamental disagreement over quorum rating, um, and that did get cleaned up. But I think that's an important detail in that whole mix of the whole hurt feelings part of the side of this. Yeah. And, you know, when you're dealing with any kind of, um, as far as, you know, relationships are, they kind of mirror in a way that they would in real life. There's an element of trust, uh, accountability, reliability involved in NS relationships between regions as far as, you know, vesting your faith in an ally. And I will, I will say that I do recall what you're referring to at the time that the CCD news broke, um, you know, from when they from when they originally plant tried to attempt to plant uh, an informant in our region, I was a vice delegate, and then later on when the whole debacle came, as far as the allegate or the insinuation that the South Pacific sort of abated fascism, uh, I do recall that during early in my administration, I actually saw fit to issue a statement of clarification because obviously the North. Um, didn't mean to insinuate that in our statement. You could clearly see that we um, sort of made that clear. And I think that, yes, there were some hurt feelings at the time as far as just miscommunications. Miscommunications can happen in the diplomatic arena. And it is up to, you know, ministers of foreign affairs, delegates, etc. to, you know, do execute their duties with the most clarity and confidence to hopefully, you know, in theory, eliminate those miscommunications. But you're absolutely right in saying that they do happen, and it is sort of just the nature of the game. But at the end of the day, you know, we were friends. We're still friends. Uh, regions that, you know, have cooperated for a long time. And obviously, you obviously don't want to think badly of your friend. Um, so I, I definitely think that the statement of clarification at the time, as well as the gentleman's agreement with quorum raids and the later codification of quorum raids, definitely helped sort of de-escalate any of those rising tensions we might have seen up until this point. As far as hurt feelings, I think there was a period where that was sort of remedied because there wasn't any other issues that happened for quite a while after the fact. And, you know, before then, it was just, you know, typical business as usual for the Aurora Alliance. Is that what uh, you recall from your time as being more active, Scorch? I mean, from what I can tell you, I, I agree. I mean... I don't know. I was just, I mean, obviously I came back during the whole thing and, um, you know, I having no idea how the relations had gone over the last four years, just, uh, the way it went down was definitely uh, surprising <laughs> to me, I guess, <laughs> coming back up, you know, with no context, obviously from those last four years. So, uh, you were saying, uh, would someone be surprised at what happened? If you had told them about it, uh, what did you say, two years ago, three years ago? Uh, I mean, I can answer it for you. Uh, yes. <laughs> Obviously, I, I was. If you something like that, uh, definitely was pretty surprising. Yeah, certainly. I wouldn't say that this has been an issue that's been boiling for years at this point, sort of brewing to this culmination and this outburst. I don't think, you know, the situation re was reminiscent of that at all. 
um, two years ago, obviously, that wouldn't have been the case. Any any sort of um, conflict that could have happened, it was you know dealt with at the time in a way that was satisfactory to both parties uh, by those involved at the time. And I think that you know really what led up to this was the last six or so months. It, it really does boil down to the last six or so months with uh, former delegate Holdem's resignation, the as far as just the general apologies, retraction of statements, things of that nature, clearing up the miscommunications. But ultimately, from from what the relationship used to be to where we are today, I would say that spanned over a period of six months, and I think that's fairly evident if you look on the gameplay forums. Um, Chipoli asked the question about um, why was it why did we was the alliance repealed now and uh, how did it differ from the past disagreements? Um, I mean, I can't speak exactly to the past disagreements as much as I haven't been around as late, but uh, I definitely think that it just from my perspective, the attitude around um, it's not consolation, but the, the fallout from the resignation and kind of when everything went to the general public and how it went down, the attitude from, uh, at least from my perspective, from the defender side seemed to be, I mean, they just didn't seem to be as willing to, um, you know, admit some of the wrongs or being willing to talk about it. Kind of like I said earlier, the whole idea of a Utah time neo-moralism, it just seems like an, an ends make the means kind of thing. So they were like, you know, it, it just didn't seem very negotiable to begin with. And then, uh, you know, you guys can talk about what you guys thought was the last straw, being more knowledgeable on the general recent happenings. But just as a somewhat of an outside perspective, it just didn't seem like a very negotiable environment. Um, from their side. I don't know what the back room talks were like or anything like that. That's just completely my perspective. So I don't think as far as, you know, going back to like the bump in the road analogy, I don't necessarily think that it's possible nor reasonable to have a relationship, in this case a friendship, that's completely unfazed by any sort of, you know, circumstance or situations. I think that you know, disagreements are natural. They can be healthy in a way, in any relationship, in us or otherwise. Um, because obviously no no two parties are going to agree all the time and be in sync all the time. As idealized and utopian-like as that might be, it's just simply not the case. I think what, in addressing Chipotle's question about what makes these last six months really different from any other prior disagreements we may have ever had with the South is that um, I think it's just people's willingness, like like Scorch was remarking on the attitude, people's willingness to trust that people are acting in good faith. I think in past examples, it was, oh, this is a this is a relatively, you know, trivial issue in a way. And it's like, okay, we're going to be able to solve this with, you know, diplomacy through the normal avenues that you would um, see the executive government go through. But I think that, you know, People were necessarily more hurt in this situation as far as public perception was concerned, because a lot of people saw the word, you know, read the words, but saw the actions as not aligning with what was trying to, you know, be communicated. And I think that really did harm people's willingness to want to trust in what these statements were saying on both sides. Uh, you know, South Pacificans' willingness to understand the North and North Pacificans' willingness to understand the South. I think, in addition to miscommunications between the governments, I think that there was also just a lot more vocal um, perspectives from the citizenry as far as can we, can we trust, you know, that what they're saying is what's going to happen? Or, you know, are they, are they necessarily acting in good, in good faith? Is there any ulterior motives? Do they want to smooth this over for a particular reason other than to safeguard the relationship. I think there was a lot more um, doubt, in a way, on both sides. I think that's the main thing that made it different. In the past, it's always been, they've been our allies for, you know, seven, eight, nine plus years, decade going on. It's like, okay, obviously this is a minor snag, and it pales in comparison to everything else that's happened. So why would we stop now, you know? But... 
the situation's a bit different in the sense that I think the timing aligns differently as far as when things came out the way that they did. I think that really hurt people's um, willingness to extend that uh, confidence in good faith. And I think that, uh, obviously, you know, the the outcome was heavily affected by the people's willingness to continue this relationship. One thing that I do want to touch on is the actual vote itself. Um, you know, this is sort of the falling action of um, just the vote being called for to begin with. Obviously, there was a there was an inquiry done by the RA that kind of you know called on what what's happening in this instance. What's the executive government doing as far as, you know, handling this situation? And it eventually resulted in um, the Regional Assembly calling upon the delegate to put this forward, uh, to put a repeal motion forward so that, you know, there was a sort of referendum, in a sense, of the RA voting on it. Um, and, and one thing to observe from this vote is um, that a lot of longtime TSP, TNPers really did um, seem to want to oppose the vote. Of those who did vote nay to the motion of repealing it was a lot of our members who have been around for longer who might have been around when the treaty was in its infancy and when the relationship was you know new whereas you see a lot of the citizens who i would say joined post 2017 ish um you see you, you saw a lot of them vote a and 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 you know vote to repeal the treaty so i'm wondering if the if there was a particular you know reasoning for why that might have been or what the dynamics at play might have been for that for why some long-standing TN TNPers obviously wanted to keep the relationship whereas those maybe you know more actively involved with gameplay nowadays uh wanted to see an end to it at this point do you think that there was anything at play there scorch as far as why that might have been i mean you know, i definitely think uh a lot of those um players who've been here for a long time you know, I think you can, if, if they've been here since the treaties uh, was passed in the first place, uh, you, you can kind of say, well, if it's weathered everything for a decade, why can't it weather this? Like, I think we can make it work, right? Because you like, you know, you were saying earlier, it's not like it's been, um, you know, I don't think it's ever gotten to this severity, but it, things haven't been perfect for the entire decade between the relations. So I think, you know, that would that's just my guess of like well we've done it for this long i mean the same argument that you were talking about i think we referenced earlier of we've done it for this long we've been allies for this long we've weathered this much stuff like i was here when it kind of all got put together so i think we could work through this um you know whereas newer players probably don't come in with that uh with that same mentality uh, it's just my guess of it i don't i don't want to like I'm, i know their minds i'm just guessing as to that could be a reason. Um, and I think also the willingness to trust if it has lasted that long, um, they are more willing to trust, as you were saying earlier, uh, the words and intentions behind the words of uh, ESP and that they really did mean what they were saying. Yeah, and, and what did you see from that, uh, Bob, as far as, you know, I would say your perspective, seeing some of these more seasoned TN peers vote to keep the treaty. What were your thoughts on that? Um honestly I voted to repeal the treaty. Um because I ultimately can't have faith that TSP will keep up their end of a bargain with TNP right now. Um and I understand and respect the viewpoint that um that you know, it's a it's a ten years standing alliance. These are just these are there are bumps in the road. I understand that, but at, on the other side of the token, these are different circumstances. Um, there are different players around now. There are different ideologies around now. Um, the circumstances of the game have changed since ten years ago. Um, and I guess I'm just not old enough yet to say, get off my lawn. Uh, we're keeping up. They're keeping this treaty. Chipotle asks, thoughts on possibly signing a new treaty with the South Pacific in the distant future? Will our relationship be prepared? Re repaired, excuse me. I can see it happening. 
I can totally see a another treaty with TSP happening. Um, I can't exactly say when, um, but again, there's still enough goodwill. There's still enough in common between the two regions that you can sort of you can see it happening again in an organic manner. I can see it happening. I don't know when, I don't know how, but I think it will. I obviously, you know, can't speak to TSP's perspective of these events because I'm obviously not involved with the South. Uh, but what I do think is, you know, and what I have observed is that there was talk of potentially replacing the Aurora Alliance after it was repealed with, you know, at least a non-aggression pact, which I think just on, on its face sort of signifies that by no means are the North and the South enemies now. Uh, I don't think you would necessarily reasonably conclude that, oh, the treaty's gone, so they're, they're clearly, you know... Uh, diametrically opposed to us. I would not say that by any stretch. Uh, the fact that, you know, the embassies have been maintained and that I'm sure, you know, discussion is still ongoing and that line of communication is still open between the two governments. I think that signifies that, you know, even though they might not be treaty allies, I, I would say that they're still, you know, friends. We're both feeders. There's a lot in common there. Um, and I think that definitely by no means are we, are the two regions like beyond repair as far as their relationship. I think that, you know, regardless of whether we see the treaty replaced with a, a you know, different agreement, uh, it's, it's, it's definitely going to take some time. The, the old adage that, you know, the time heals all wounds, I think that necessarily would apply here. Um, people aren't going to be accepting. I, I don't necessarily... You know, think it's reasonable to request certain actions of either party because that just wouldn't align with the timeline. I've said it before as far as internal discussions go, in my own opinion, is that asking TSP to do something or TNP asking um, anyone to do something in this particular instance wouldn't necessarily be fair if our, if our inclinations are going to remain the same. There's no sense in asking someone to change something if we're going to have the same opinion of them regardless, you know? I, I think it would be disingenuous for us to request that of them, and likewise, um, vice versa. Because I think, you know, it's unfortunate that what's happened, I think that we can all agree on that. But at the end of the day, we do have to prioritize moving forward as far as what the relationship is going to look like. And I think that in the future, that relationship could be friendly, or at least neutral. I definitely don't think it's going to be hostile, per se. Um, in, in, a, in an ideal world, it wouldn't be hostile, because TSP and TNP have enjoyed a long relationship that for quite a while was fruitful. It's just, I think, you know, it's enduring a sort of test that it perhaps hasn't. In its history. Cash asks, following the level of involvement and pressure from within the TNP citizenry to get the motion to repeal the treaty, should the RA have the ability to repeal treaties by vote in the future as well as the delegate, as has been suggested in the RA? Or is that power something that should stay with the delegate? So what I believe he's referring to here is that yesterday, actually, we saw a series of of proposals by LD, Lord Dominator, a citizen of the North, who um, essentially was talking about, you know, the, the balance of power between the RA and the delegate as far as diplomatic restrictions, policy, input, suggestions, etc. Uh, have you guys, each of you, had a chance to read through these yet, these proposals? Uh, I gave it a skim. Yeah, I, I, I looked at them, uh, and I was looking at the comments through them, and and uh, saw, you know, people's thoughts, uh, even the proposals, specifically the uh, ones about foreign affairs. So, okay, so that's that's a good baseline to work with. So, as uh, you know, you were reading through them and reading people's comments. Is there any particular comment that you think really highlighted what's important to you as far as this issue? Or did, did you say, did you, I guess what I'm asking here is on principle, did you agree with the suggested changes? And if so, why? Well, I do understand the concern of 
LD. And I think it kind of came from a place of, um, and I know Sanctaria said this as well, that it just doesn't feel sometimes that the RA is on an equal level with the executive, or at least some people don't feel that it's handled in that manner anymore. But I also think that it would be really hard to make uh, certain FA decisions if the delegate was worried about the RA being able to do things uh, to, to repeal um, treaties as suggested. Like, I just I kind of understand where ComFed specifically, I believe, put that in there. Now, he was much more strongly opposed to it than I'm going to say in here. Um, but I, I just, I agree that it would, it would prevent, it would make things a little hard on the delegate in order to properly represent um, certain things to other regions and maybe make guarantees or uh, promote interests, knowing that it could be more easily overturned by the RA uh, than it had been in the past, if this proposal were to pass. That's, that's what I think, so. Yeah, there was a clash of concerns. It's the it's the traditional sort of if the delegate doesn't have the ability to, you know, advocate for the region and say, hey, this is what's going to happen as far as foreign policy, then necessarily who does? Who does have that responsibility? Who does have that authority? And it sort of calls into question as far as the balance of power between the branches. My personal take on it, and I did, I will say, I did uh, disagree with ComFed in the sense that I don't necessarily think that conflict between the two branches would be a quote-unquote disaster, as you described. I think that in any democratic system, uh, debate, discussion, etc. is healthy in that environment, so long as it's constructive. And I think if you enable, if you empower the citizenry to have uh, more directive as far as foreign policy is concerned, I personally think that it would amount to being constructive. Because when when you when you think about uh, regions becoming something, you know, like Bob said earlier in the broadcast, the game is different than it was five or six years ago. That trend's going to continue. Nothing stays the same. Time always moves forward. I think that in order to make sure that the North Pacific remains a region that people are, you know, proud to be citizens of and are content with our regional standing. I think that the citizens do have to have input on that process. That's not to say that the delegate can't have input on that process. Absolutely, the delegate can and should. But I do think that it is appropriate for the RA to have some say-so short of either recalling the delegate due to an unpopular decision, not voting for them again due to an unpopular decision, or, in, as it was done in this case, um, sort of motioning for them to do something on the RA's behalf. I think if you empower the RA to do that themselves, with or without the delegate, uh, you get much more of a representative system. Because maybe maybe it turns out that people ask for the RA to have their input, and it turns out that the delegate's decision was the right one all along, and citizens vote for that, and and, and so be it, you know. But the, the, the perspective that I take from this is that as recent events have shown us, uh, one or two people can get it wrong. That's entirely possible. People are human. They're valuable. They make mistakes. No problem. But I think that as a body, an all-citizen legislature like the RA, is there's a degree of stability involved in its decisions and some sort of continuity in the sense that, you know, it, it's more representative of what the whole region thinks as opposed to those one or two people. So I, I think as a result, it's less likely for the citizens to get it wrong as it is for an administration to get it wrong or one or two people to get it wrong when speaking in a room, you know? I think that... I'm not saying that the citizens are necessarily going to be right all the time either, because hindsight's 2020. But if the citizens are wrong when it comes to a diplomatic event, then, I mean, they're wrong. So, so be it in that case. But I think it's a lot easier for the collective responsibility of that situation to rest on the shoulders of the citizenry as opposed to just one person or their minister. I think instead of playing the blame game, it's a lot easier if we all just come together and say, hey, this was a decision of the RA. There's nothing particularly wrong with that, but this is a decision that we've made, so this is the path that we're going to go down. That was my personal take on it. Bob, did you have anything to add? No, that all seems perfectly logical. In terms of my take on the, uh, on the proposal itself, I agree with you, Robes. 
Um, I think there is an in inherent stability in a democratic system like TNPs, wherein you have a lot of the same voices, a lot of the same perspectives, um, who've seen it all, been through it all, that a delegate may not have been here for, may have a different perspective on, et cetera. Um, and I think it's important in this scenario um, that the delegate have some sort of check of sorts on their power to unilaterally make FA decisions. Because whilst there is a certain amount of stability and power to the delegate role is expected, um, and for good reason, it's just something we can rely on at this point, is a, is a delegate with their wits about them. We, we don't, we can confidently say we don't elect nitwits that often anymore. Um, but on the other side of the token, there needs to be some sort of ability without, necessi without necessitating a recall that the RA can say, whoa, 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 we're not on board with this. Take a step back. Yeah, and one of the other, one of the other points that came up was how motioning for a recall would be a bit of a disproportionate response to, Agree. to, a, to a foreign policy disagreement. I mean, it's entirely plausible that the delegates' administration and the general consensus of the citizens isn't always going to be in sync. I don't think it's reasonably – it can't be reasonably expected that it's always going to be in sync or that the delegate is always going to have the support of the vast majority of citizens. Um, people have different perspectives. People have different takes. Uh, one of the points that ComFed made at the end of their initial post in opposition to these uh, su suggested changes was that if you don't like what they did, then you just simply wouldn't vote for them again. And I think to this point, my main rebuttal was that, well, yes, you wouldn't vote for them again if they did something that you disliked, naturally so, but what if what they do during the time that you're unable to have any other avenue towards opposing it, what if that does irreparable damage in a way that it's either impossible to recover from or very difficult to recover from you're sort of left with that and it's not necessarily uh, another point that i kind of want to expand on it's it's not necessarily fair to your successors in that sense to have to inherit this mess that you might have created uh, i think a lot of people in in recent times didn't necessarily envy grundu's position of having to become acting delegate and sort of sort that mess out post holdem's re uh, resignation which is actually a great segue into another question asked by an audience member. Chipoli asks, how has the drama impacted us these last two months, i.e. Holdem's resignation? Um, you know, I think it's definitely something, I, I won't say unprecedented, because delegates have resigned before. Um, we saw it with Toom, but the, the thing with that is that was over seven years ago. Uh, so in recent TNP history, we're talking the last three to four years, it, it has not happened. It was very, um, in a way, very not only surprising, but I would use even the word jarring, because people, you know, even a week up until that, the news broke that this these things had happened. I don't think anyone was, you know, anticipating or even suggesting that, hey, the delegate might resign within a week. Um, and I think that because it's so unusual to have happened, it definitely kind of sort of fed on the uncert uncertainty of citizens because it's just naturally assumed that the delegate either sits there. Most delegates sit there for two terms, you know, let alone not even finishing one. Um, I think that was very surprising to people. And I think that it, it all came so quickly over the span of what was it? Three or four days that really those events just changed the entire landscape sort of changed. We had an acting delegate for the first time in seven years plus. Uh, we had an acting vice delegate, which, you know, the whole line of succession thing got triggered, which doesn't usually happen in TNP. We take the stability factor of it for granted a lot of times, I feel like, and it's just naturally assumed that all the pieces are going to fall in place the same way that they always have. And that wasn't necessarily the case this time around, so I think that was quite surprising to people. Yeah, no, I, I agree with um, everything you said about that. Um, if you don't mind, is it okay if we go back to that 
to the proposal because I think it's kind of an important topic. I just had a couple of questions about oh, yeah. your guys' point of view of it. Yeah, absolutely. So, we can go back to that. Um, you know, you were talking about, um, you know, the RA and making these decisions. And I tend to agree with you that a larger body is going to make uh, the, the more proper decision a larger percentage of the time than you could say an individual or maybe a council would. Um, but I also am wondering if the RA is going to be allowed to make some of these decisions. Um, you know, I'm just coming back, so I don't know how it has been operating the last couple of times, but where would the, like a lot of the FA information, I know a lot of people are obviously heavily informed about it, but did people know about what was going on with TSP before whim or hold them basically revealed it and if so how would the ra make decisions about information it might not even possibly have because a lot of those talks kind of go on in privacy that's what we have freedom of information act disclosures and the like for um that's what we have the actual experience of the delegate and the fa minister to rely on um, there are other ways of getting information um, yeah, that absolutely. aren't yeah. just necessarily being in the room. Yeah, no, for sure. I think it's entirely possible that, you know, maybe a newcomer citizen who's in the RA doesn't necessarily grasp the nuance or the, the level of uh, severity of certain decisions and stuff like that. And, you know, they might be a bit premature in their actions, but I think that it's reasonable to say that we always have uh, very, very steady-handed uh, members of the RA who are definitely w willing to advocate for sensible positions and willing to get, you know, their thoughts out there. So I don't necessarily think we're ever going to experience uh, a sort of mob rule by the uninformed. I don't, and not to say that you were suggesting that would happen either, but I'm saying I think that concern can be somewhat downplayed in the sense that you're always going to have people who can uh, can address the situation with a degree of uh, either knowledge, expertise, experience, etc. Um, and I think that's one of the most uh, important elements that the RA, one of the most important tools that it has at, it, at its disposal is the people within it. Uh, you have people who, you know, have history as being the delegate. You have people who have history as being ministers who have been in the room for these types of conversations. So while we might not necessarily have the exact information of what was said, uh, like Bob mentioned, there are ways of getting that. But even short of getting that, uh, I think that, you know, there's this general expectation that, yeah, this is how it, it usually would work. And so if something isn't working the way that it would usually work, then perhaps something has gone wrong. And of course, the RA can address that. The RA also... Um, not necessarily in an expressed power, but more in more in like, uh, you know, just by its nature and that kind of thing. Uh, it has the ability to sort of pry deeper into the executive actions as far as, you know, uh, freedom of information, but just general accountability. Like there's nothing wrong with asking ministers or asking the delegate, hey, what happened here? And of course, then it would be up to the delegate or their assigned minister to respond to those inquiries. Um, and of course, failure to do so would be met with scrutiny and rightfully so. So I think that the RA has the power to do these things. It's just more so making clear that, yes, this is absolutely possible. And I think that necessarily just because they have the power doesn't mean that they'll use it. But I think that giving people more choices is really important as far as a functioning democracy goes, because then we don't have these sort of instances where it's a disproportionate response to what has happened. Yeah, yeah no, I mean, I... I... I definitely can see what you guys are saying and see where you're coming from. And I completely agree with the accountability point. And that it definitely seemed like in some points there has been disconnects from the citizenry and RA as a whole and the executive and the timeline of certain actions or the actual implementation of certain actions. So <laughs> I can 100% see that point. I completely agree that it needs to be more of a line of whether it be communication or something else going on. Um, and Dart's, I can see uh, Dart's comments. And I mean, I think we, I'm not sure, he might have left after I left, so I can kind of understand um, where he's coming from. Um, 
you know, like I said, I just I, I can understand some of the dissents to these this proposal about kind of I mean, how much do you want to how much do you want to check the delegate? I guess right you you know. But uh, recently, it, you know, going back to the question, how has the drama impacted us in these last two months? Holden's resignation and now uh, um, Garundu taking over. That seems to be. I don't know if that was a thing for the last year. Um, I don't know if that was a thing from the last two years, but it definitely seems that there's a disconnect between the citizenry and the executive and how actions are being going about and what information is available um, and how the timelines of that too. And you were saying it's like a freedom of information request, Bob, and that is a great resource. I'm just worried about making it like a more roundabout way. Like, you know, one of the concerns was how long certain things were taking. You know, well, for the RA to get all the information, I'm not sure that's going to really speed up the process. I'm not sure that's really the main goal of the proposal in the first place. But just like I said, these are just all the things I'm questioning in my head. I am not like a hard line stance on either of these things, but I can understand the concerns. And when proposing something like this, I think personally, I'm going to stand more on the line of, um, of uh, kind of not the status quo per se, but I just am a little worried about changing it kind of in this way. Yeah, I think I think the concerns have have a basis. They have, you know, uh, validity. But I, I would generally say I maintain the the position that I've expressed, even in light of that, and even considering those considerations. Uh, to round out the topic before we kind of switch gears to something else that's happened in recent TNP news, let's answer uh, the last question we have on this, which was, um, of course. It was from Cash, in which he says, How have the events positioned us with the Defender Sphere now in terms of foreign relations? The fun part for me personally was that uh, when I was originally, and don't get me wrong, I was very outspoken, loud about this, uh, is that it, it used to be, oh, here's Rob shouting out the clouds. You know, I, I get the sense that that was just the general reception. And as, and as the events kind of unfolded, I kind of became um, more valid in, in in the way I would say, um, as as far as people now saw kind of what I was saying is a bit more reasonable because it ca it became more of a widespread belief and consensus than it used to be, um, which kind of I I won't lie it made me feel a bit better that I wasn't the outlier. Um, I've said that before. I was very opposed. I've I've long been opposed to moralism just because I disagree with it in principle. Uh, but even now, especially one one of the things that's been brought up is that post frontiers and strongholds, moralism actually kind of has to adapt in the sense that because people and communities can opt out of being raided now, and become strongholds, it's it's more of an opt in game as far as if you want to, you know, put yourself at risk. So in a way, it's not necessarily oh they're preying upon the innocent. So that kind of has to be explored further, and I'm sure those in the defenders field will um, explore that further. But it personally, as a as a ideal, uh, I've long opposed moralism. As far as how it plays into our defender sphere relationships, you know, we we still maintain relations with members of the Aegis Accords. Uh, we have a treaty with TRR. We have a treaty with Europea. We up until very recently had a treaty with TSP. So we still very much do have relationships with regions who are either defenders themselves or allied to defenders. And, you know, I think that it, it really it really depends on, number one, what the evolution of that ideal, uh, moralism, neo-moralism, however you'd like to characterize it, it, it depends on how that evolves over time. And it also depends on um, the willingness of the North Pacific to keep up these relationships in, in spite of what might happen. So, of course, with TRR, and as we're going to get into with this very next topic, TRR is a region that, like, as, again, hindsight being 2020, they've seemed very sincere and reliable in their relationship with us. I think that's been a widely expressed sentiment. So people are still very much um, in favor of, like, other uh, relationships with, def with Defender regions. It's not like, oh, no, we're not going to associate with Defenders. No, 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 no. TNP, um, that's not really a point of contention for us. It's more we value the friendships, we value the relationships. Euro, um, you know, just 
is a treaty ally of ours, and they recently joined the Aegis Accords. So I don't think you're necessarily going to see a break-off. I don't think that's on the table at all, and I don't think we'd want it to be on the table. Um, I, I think, you know, the relationships that we have are likely going to continue. Um, it's just a matter of the tone that the continuation takes, as far as in the interregional arena. Because now that we're not treaty partners with TSP, that doesn't necessarily mean we'll oppose TSP, as I mentioned prior. Um, but we, we, we might not necessarily agree with other members of the Aegis Accord. So I think maybe not treating them as a sort of monolithic blob of a group is pretty important. Because if we do that, we can get clouded over, you know, what, what the good aspects of those relationships are. Whereas there's a lot of good to be found there, is what I would say, even as someone who is opposed to moralism. Um, there is good there with TRR, um, etc. And I think that those relationships are likely to continue even despite these hiccups with TSB. So we're going to switch topics to our second topic. That was the first big topic. This other topic is going to be a lot shorter. So it is, uh, moving on. We'd like to discuss the North Pacific versus St. George, AKA Mad Jack court case. Uh, to begin this topic, we're going to do a sort of a summary of events here uh, as far as what's happened over the course of the case. Um, of course, it was obtained, it was it was known publicly uh, recently that Europea had acquired some information. It's uncertain how they acquired said information, and and people are speculating that they might not necessarily have been privy to it by normal means. As a result, there was a dispatch posted by ex-Minister of Culture Magic, in which the dispatch itself is titled, Europea's President is Spying on the Rejected Realms. That's the title of the dispatch. Now, since that dispatch was posted five days ago, it's achieved over 1,300 reads and has 53 upvotes. So naturally, this has taken the GP community by storm, because... Euro is a treaty ally of uh, of T of TNP, so it's it's very um, it's a very concerning incident that this might have occurred if it did occur. Um, and you know, as a result of that dispatch being posted, a court case has been brought against Mad Jack, aka Saint George, for the charge of espionage. Since that court case was brought about, uh, we've had two justices recuse themselves, both Pele, the AKA Ghost, as well as Chief Justice Attempted Socialism, and we've seen temporary hearing officers appointed in their stead, that being Sanctaria, um, please help me out on who the other one was, Sanctaria, oh, great, GBM, GBM. Yeah, so we had Sanctaria and GBM. Um, and then a standby hearing officer, as is protocol in case, you know, something else happens, uh, Oracle was appointed. But Oracle's appointment is really kind of where the nature of this court case changes. Because uh, immediately following that, the defense team of both Kretox and Dredton, uh, speaking through Kretox as part of uh, Mad Jack's legal defense, has now motioned for a mistrial. What is your initial reaction to that, Scorch? Uh, he is a, a very active defense attorney right now. That's what I got to give him. Uh, no, I mean, I, I think the uh, reaction to the whole thing is kind of um, wild. Um, uh, and, you know, just the whole indictment coming down, especially as quickly as it did, I think was a bit of, uh, I had a little bit of, uh, again, kind of similar we were talking about uh, with the RA versus the executive. I think that there was definitely a disconnect on that one um, where you, it seemed as a, a certain people thought it was interesting that the executive was taking action against its own citizens before taking an action against the party that many thought was actually at fault. Um, so I think that's a interesting point. I don't know. Like I said, I'm not going to comment on what is and isn't um, 
correct or factual or whatever. That's just what I saw in certain discussions. Um, but yeah, I think the court as a whole, do I, do I think it's going to go as a mistrial? I mean, you lose a very knowledgeable and smart individual. So I have faith in him to make whatever is the proper decision. <laughs> He's been doing this a long time. Yeah, and you know it's important to observe that uh, as it's a, it's a developing situation. So, as far as who's at fault, that situation is developing. But as far as how the trial will go, that's obviously also developing. I think the main um, commonality, as far as the varying beliefs about what's happened here, is that TRR is undoubtedly the victim of whatever has happened here, regardless of who's at fault. They're the ones who reportedly had information taken from them, so I think it's it's a generally uh, natural response to assume that they are the victims here. But also, uh, as far as the court case is concerned, I actually wasn't under the impression that the whole mistrial thing was going to become an actual element at play in the court case. It was mentioned a day before it happened, in what I thought was a joking kind of tone, um, and as it turned out, no, the defense actually did motion for a mistrial, which I was a bit surprised by. But I will say, the defense team of Dredton and Gretox has definitely delivered as far as, like, their commitment to defending the defendant, if you will. Like, they, they're, they're on it as far as um, making sure that the defendant doesn't self-incriminate. And also making sure that the trial is sort of handled with the ball being in their court now. Because as you say, Elu, Elu is going to make that decision, and we do have faith that Elu is going to make that decision. But his position now, even as moderating justice, is a bit more reactionary, and as is the prosecution. So instead of the prosecution leveling charges and the defense responding to them, we're now getting the defense making its motion first. And the prosecutor, they're being asked if they have anything to say in response to it. So it's sort of a, a change in pace, a changing of tempo. And I find that really interesting. Yeah, no, I agree. They definitely came out on the offensive and made sure they got uh, as much stuff in as they could. And uh, obviously it took a while before a prosecutor was even appointed. And I know there was kind of a joke put in uh, somewhere that uh, the defense was going to take up Every, it was going to recruit every member of the bar before a prosecutor could be appointed. And I knew that I didn't see that there were many members of the bar who, like, such as Dredton, who did not appear who would even be, who knows if they would even be willing to be prosecuted for this case. Uh, obviously, Tom's is now um, the prosecutor. But yeah, no, they definitely came out firing and they had that advantage of um, not even really having someone else to. Uh, go against them for a little bit. And I'd say they definitely took advantage of it. So that's, they've done a, they've, they've made a good example of what uh, a defense team should do, I guess. <laughs> I get the sense. And again, this is, this is only speaking to my sort of speculation about this. I'm not necessarily saying that this is what happened. I'm also not saying that this isn't what happened. But I, I don't think that a situation like this just arises, like, naturally. I, I think some de definitely some degree of thought had to be put into this, but it also seemed like the defense was very comfortable with what was going on here as far as, uh, if you, if, if you, even if you look at the timestamps, as soon as that Oracle appointment was made, the defense was on it, and that statement was prepared. Like, they, they it seems like that was part of the defense strategy. Um... Obviously, for, for decent reasons, attempted socialism was uh, recusing themselves. Deputy Minister of Foreign Affairs might have had access to certain conversations that others might not have. You, needed, you need a fair and partial trial. But upon the law saying, you know, there, there is a point of contention about does the law require the Chief Justice to do it at this point? Well, when they came back in and did it, the defense, you know, took, took advantage of that opportunity. So that, that, to me, demonstrates some awareness and some planning as far as and I'm not I'm not suggesting any kind of malice intent here. That's absolutely not what I'm saying. I'm saying this seems like a very smart, knowledgeable, measured defense team. Because if you didn't have that, I don't think you'd necessarily see the situation materializing as it has now. I don't think that that would have been something that just would have happened out of thin air. Like, oh, here's Oracle going to be appointed. And then, you know, within a few hours, oh, here's the defense mistrial, you know? 
I don't want to say I don't want to say that was a trap because that makes it sound like the defense is like, oh, well, gotcha, you know. But as far as like, you know, you know, there's always there's always a legal strategizing aspect to this. Um, and I think that if that was the strategy, then it seems to have been triggered by by that uh, by that appointment of the SHO, the standby hearing officer. Yeah, no, they were definitely on top of it, and uh, they. Uh, I mean, this is. I mean, this is a very. Their goal is to get him. You know, is to get him off. Is to get Saint uh, Mad Jack off clean. So I mean, they're pulling out every card they can, which is, you know, I guess that's what the ideal defense team would do. So. Right. Um, yeah. It, it, you I know, mean, this is this is perfect for them. <laughs> Yeah, and there's always there's always like a lawyer's conundrum of like, oh, you're defending this person, but like, no, don't get me wrong, they're a hundred percent on it. Like, I don't know, I don't know, I'm not privy to the conversations of if Mad Jack selected them or if they came to Mad Jack wanting to defend him, but they they are out there in full force, and uh, I would say at this particular moment, from where I sit, they seem to have taken control of this trial. Now that could change later today. It could change tomorrow. We'll have to see. But as far as the defense team being active and knowledgeable about the law and invoking it to support their case, um, they seem to be doing that quite proficiently. And on the point of, um, you know, the the actual allegations that Mad Jack claimed to have receipts of about, you know, President Rand's and the information that the European administration had obtained, there's actually been a further development in the uh, GA area, if you will, that uh, someone who's made a lot of comments recently in about foreign affairs between various regions has actually been appointed to TSP's Foreign Affairs Advisory sort of council. And in a way, that kind of ties in with the whole TSP thing. But also, it kind of sets up this, because... If, if for some reason the newly admitted Europea to the Aegis Accords, the newly admitted member, if, if the allegations were true, and again, we haven't determined if they are, but supposing they were, that would sort of present a, a bit of an issue within the alliance itself, within the accords themselves. Because obviously one of the provisions in the charter if you, of, the, of the accords is that no, you cannot commit uh, you cannot commit espionage against your fellow members. So I think it, people people had said that MJ was sort of like a whistleblower in this sense, and then there was a bit of uh, pushback about like no, that's not what whistleblower really applies to because that would that would insinuate that Grundu or his administration is at fault. And I don't think that's really something that we here at MBS particularly care to um, comment on as far as. You know, TRR, obviously, I feel like, in a way, this situation demands a response from them because, you know, they they clearly um, have been wronged here, if you will, as as I would say. But it can't, it can't be met lying down, especially if the allegations are true, because if they are true, then that presents a problem within the Accords themselves and the new member that was admitted. Yeah, I know, that would definitely uh, cause some issues, um, but... They probably, I imagine, they probably want to make sure that they go in having all of the correct information. So, right, um, yeah, you, yeah, that's that's obviously going to be something that it takes time to formulate. You know, that collection of information and get that from the appropriate avenues that you need to. But it it's kind of ironic that it takes you know time to get it through the appropriate avenues when the entire situation hinges on information that might or might not have been obtained through incorrect avenues. I find that to be an interesting parallel. And it's it's a very, very nuanced situation as it develops, really is. Yeah, I agree. I mean the whole thing is about the initial allegation made by Magic is about getting information through I guess sources that you're not really supposed to have, and now it kind of, in a way, his trial is pretty much the same thing. So um, it's the same accusation against him. So, or at least his isn't exactly the same. His is revealing information that obviously wasn't supposed to be. So it's definitely going to be an interesting development. I will note um, one of the things that I questioned early on, um, once once the indictment was filed is particularly why it was filed under the charge of espionage as opposed to the charge of gross misconduct. And my reasoning for this was, at the time, 
that if if the claim is that as an advisor to the delegate, Magic had access to information which he otherwise would not have had he not held that position, then to me it seems like position specific, which is of course attached to an oath, the oath of office, in which you would, you know, usually indict for gross misconduct. But I suppose the caveat to that is since it has to do with information, especially when it relates to a treaty to ally, I guess that's what sort of uh, triggered the espionage charge as opposed to the gross misconduct charge. And what's worth noting is that those two charges do carry different penalties. Um, if you if you look in the penal code, the so gross misconduct as far as its penalty is a bit less severe than the charge of espionage, and explainably so. But a, as the penal code says, um, espionage will be punishable by the suspension of speech and or voting rights for whatever finite du duration the court sees fit. Whereas gross misconduct, on the other hand, is punishable by removal from office, which wouldn't have been applicable since MJ resigned. He removed himself from office, effectively, and the suspension of voting rights. So the only additional thing that really would have applied espionage versus gross misconduct is suspension of speech for a, a set duration. Which, in a way, I guess the espionage charge is sort of an upgraded version of the gross misconduct charge, and it might have it might have uh, fit fit the situation a bit better since it had to deal with information sharing. Do you think uh, the espionage was the right charge or should they have went with gross misconduct or something like that? Um, I mean, you, you're definitely right about the uh, espionage being about information. I mean, if you look at you know, the criminal covers, the find is sharing information with a group or region uh, when that act of sharing has not been legitimately sanctioned by the entity the information is gathered from. I think you can make an argument that that's uh, a charge. Um, yeah, if, if you can prove it, but I, I I definitely agree that where you're coming from. I think it's also it's I think it would be a little easier too to go. Uh, I mean, just in general, I think the gross misconduct charge would definitely be an easier route to go along for the reason you you know partially because it's um, you know a lesser penalty and it's because it's, it's a broader charge, so it's not as it's a little right. easier to yeah. prove it. Uh, but it seems like the executive wanted to go the whole. All, all the whole way with this one. So, um, you know, I think that they definitely have an argument for it. Uh, if, if, I mean, again, this is all contingent about what is true, and I obviously am not privy to that. Um, so, you know, I think they're really going for it. Uh, that's that's really my opinion of it, is that they are really, uh, really going for it. And I think Garundu, I kind of made it clear that he didn't genuinely think that... Um, Magic had committed espionage, so that's why he felt obligated to file the charge in the way he did. So, yeah, and it's just a testament to how developing situations can really shape dynamic viewpoints. Because in illustrating my thinking about gross misconduct versus espionage, you know, it was brought to my attention that, yeah, espionage is more situation-specific because it had to deal with information sharing. So now, in sort of an amending of that line of thinking, I would say that espionage was the right charge as far as what the government wanted to go for or what they appear to want to go for um, in, in, in indicting Medjack. I think that, you know... Either technically could have been applicable. I think maybe espionage might have been more appropriate, again, in line of what what the what the charge was for, you know? Even though you could have used a different charge, I think in the spirit of the indictment, what it was about, espionage, fits better. Um, but what you were saying about, I think it's a good point, what were you saying about gross misconduct being more wide and broad? I think what's actually interesting about this, this actually made me think, that perhaps had the charge been gross misconduct, the trial might have actually been easier for the government to prove than it's it's appearing to be right now. Because espionage is a higher bar as far as like a charge, is a higher bar to meet for the prosecution, I'm wondering if that bar is going to be more difficult to meet because they chose the route of espionage as opposed to gross misconduct. I think it'd be easier, and this again, this is just my take, I'm not even a member of the bar, so take that for what you will, it would be easier to advocate for gross misconduct than it would be for espionage. I personally think that I, if I were the prosecution, would have an easier time proving that than I would espionage. Because espionage, there's multiple layers to it, whereas uh, gross misconduct, a lot of times it's very cut and dry. Did you have an oath? 
okay, in what spirit did you violate this oath? If you didn't violate this oath, how didn't you violate this oath? Like, those kind of questions arise. With espionage, there's a lot more, okay, so this ally got this information from who, at what time, like, there's a lot more factors at play. I think that if you use gross misconduct, which they didn't do, I think as far as getting an actual conviction, like a successful indictment, I think it might have been easier, but, uh, yeah. No, I... I agree with you. I was, you know, kind of hinting earlier was the, um, but I think it would be, it would have been an easier case had they just gone with gross misconduct uh, instead of uh, espionage. And I think that uh, that gross misconduct charge is kind of just it's you know being that broader charge you can kind of bring it up against uh, any official when they you feel that they've done something wrong or uh, you know that's not it's against the oath and it's a lot easier to prove and because of that it has that lower uh punishment um but uh, yeah i mean like we can speculate about to why uh, some people are going to do but uh, clearly they didn't want to do that clearly they wanted to go with the government wanted to go with a higher charge more severe charge um and apparently i mean they must think that they have the information to prove it so uh you know it's definitely as we're talking about the defense has definitely put it in their court and uh, we're going to see what happens, but they, they must think that they can get this through because I would have agreed with you that if, if you really wanted to get something, you know, just get a charge through the gross misconduct would have been a way to go. But I don't think that that is their strategy here. <laughs> I don't, it doesn't seem to be that they just wanted to get any charge through uh, to make it easier. It seemed they had, a, they had an idea of what they wanted and they, seem to think that they have the information to be able to do that. And this is why having a live audience is so great. As Dark points out, um, there might be a tactical, a tactical implication here as for why they chose espionage as opposed to gross misconduct. So as I pointed out previously, the suspension of speech, in addition to voting rights, might be something that's at play here. It's possible that Grundy wanted to make sure that MJ doesn't speak about this, a.k.a. leak anything else, because they're claiming that he leaked. So perhaps the suspension of speech punishment, should the charge be successful, would prohibit him from doing that. I think that's an interesting element to this that I hadn't previously considered. So it's great that we have like an audience to bounce things off of here. But actually, that that is an important consideration. Maybe this, uh, maybe it wasn't. Let's get a charge like in general. Perhaps the uh, the suspension of speech was the main thing that was uh, desirable here for the government. Yeah, no, that's definitely possible. Like I said, I don't want. I'm you know, uh, that's definitely an, an interesting. Um, thought uh, of why they why they went with that charge instead um, and we'll definitely see how it plays out um, you know I know that you can you can have your speech suspended uh, with the espionage uh, you know who knows whereas you can't you can't with uh, gross misconduct you can't, just grow, you can't with, exactly yeah um, so a question we got posed here is as far as read the euro drama how will this resolve between trr and europea what is the most likely outcome concerning the aegis accords uh it's been remarked on before that the aegis accords are likely to continue by no means do i think this is the end of the agreements or anything like that or its decline uh i also don't think it's necessarily likely that they're going to entirely backpedal and suddenly expel europea from the accords just even though they recently joined um I think that'd be a, a very weird move to suddenly backpedal after these issues have arisen. So I don't, I don't necessarily see that happening. Uh, I think, like I said before, TRR has to issue some sort of response to this uh, because they are the ones who were allegedly wronged by this. And it's the belief of the vast majority of the gameplay community that they were indeed wronged. Um, so I, I feel like the ball is kind of in TRR's court as far as how they want to handle that. I'm sure that their delegate and their officers are engaged in those discussions that we here at NBS aren't privy to. Um, but I do think that once they once they issue some sort of response to that, Europea is going to have to have some things to answer for. Rather, it's, oh, we did something, or it's, oh, we didn't do something, but we understand why this, you know, might have created some distrust. I, I feel like it requires both parties to respond to it, because even if the situation isn't as alleged... 
there's it, it's still an issue of how was this allowed to happen in the first place? How was this allowed to materialize? You know, even if it didn't happen specifically as alleged, there's still stuff to answer for. So I don't think that Europea will be expelled from the Aegis Accords. I don't think that the Accords will end anytime soon. Uh, I do think that there's going to have to be some internal reflection uh, and so maybe some investigation within the members of the Aegis Accords to figure out what went wrong here, and then if something did go wrong, in fact, make amends. And if amends aren't possible, that's that's another discussion entirely. But I think, you know, for the sake of the Accords, um, reconciliation is going to have to come about in some way if if a wrong was committed. Yeah, no, I, I, I agree with that. Um, but uh, there has already been some um, discourse between the two. Am, am, I, am I wrong about that? I thought I saw that on some of the gameplay forums that there has already been some discussion about some of this between them already. You know, uh, am, I, am I incorrect about that, Dina? Uh, as far as, like, the discussion going on in the background? So... Well, I was just talking about between TRR and Europea, I'm saying. So, uh, it was asked on GP forums whether or not, or NS forums, rather, in the gameplay section, whether or not uh, TRR provided this information willingly. Because if they provided the information willingly, then obviously the allegation that they stole the information wouldn't have held up. Uh, and TRR, mm -hmm. the delegate of TRR, Catalase, uh, did confirm that they did not willingly give this information away. So somewhere along the line, uh, whether it be on behalf of Europea or just from someone who had access to TRR's, you know, private areas, uh, somewhere along the line, a leak did occur. W regardless, there's there's speculation about the identity of the person who leaked. Uh, of course, we're not going to name names because it's not proven. Um, but but also just the fact that. There's also been, like, some debate about which areas are considered private. Like, there, mm -hmm. there's almost, like, uh, some people have different optics as far as what's considered private versus what isn't, who's entitled to privacy where versus who's not. And, you know, espionage can, I guess, only really exist under the guise of privacy. Like, if there is assumed privacy, and if those privacy measures for, like, regional security and such are in place, then, yeah... That's not good, but if those areas, I guess if the overwhelming perception is those areas aren't private anyway, then the optics of the situation change a bit. Um, and of course, it's up, to, it's up to the individuals to figure out how you believe on that, but I would say that a citizen-only area, I think, it's a, I think it's a reasonable take that a citizen-only area is private for the citizens. Uh, we have that in TNP with the RA, the private halls, the RA channel, the citizens-only channel. Like, those are not areas where it'd be acceptable to take things from. So, I, I, can't, yeah. I, can't, I can't comment on how that works for TRR, but uh, I imagine since the last time I was there, it works in the same way. Yeah, no, I, I, I can't help but think the, the same thing, that I would feel that those areas are private. Um, Dark is uh, confirming that, it, uh, that they did have that uh, TR attempted to open bilateral communication. Yes. Um, yes. And mm -hmm. then you raised it to the accord as a whole. Right. Um, which is, I mean, an interesting response. I mean, you know, it's, <laughs> it's going to be definitely uh, interesting to see. And it didn't also, was it uh, Europe? You also just finished an election cycle. They did. Yes. Um, so their, their former president, Rand, actually failed their re-election, but they did not succeed in getting re-elected. And there was actually an article done by EBC, which is one of their internal news sources, um, that kind of was covering the election and was covering how a lot of the previously undecided voters, um, not, not people who voted for Rand switching to their opponent, planned, but people who were undecided voting for planned. So there was a culmination of factors, I suspect, that uh, worked with that. And obviously, you know, I, I'm not privy to how the election culture is in Europea. But what I would say is as far as people becoming undecided, that could be a result of people going from undecided to voting. That could be, you know, campaigning. Maybe an issue arose that was important to them. Maybe they looked at, you know, the candidate's previous track records. Um, as far as self-reported data from the EBC, this is from surveys that Europeans themselves took to say what was important to them. 
the Mad Jack situation did act actually did not rank very highly on the list of voter importance. Uh, candidates' performance in the past and their campaigning ranked very highly in comparison. On a scale of one to five, I believe those two issues exceeded four. Very important. And the issue of Mad Jacks, the debacle with that, ranked a little bit above two, I believe. So I guess European voters, that wasn't a main consideration to them. The main consideration was the merits of the candidates themselves. Gotcha, gotcha. No, that's all interesting information for sure. But uh, no, I just know that I just remembered th- uh, hearing that there was some communication uh, between the two. And so we'll see how that all plays out. Yeah, it's it's definitely an ongoing situation. Uh, and, and I can't I can't really call into question anything other than what they have presented because I read over their article. And so all of this is self-reported. We can take that for what we will. Um, but this is, you know, I, I have no reason to suspect that they would skew that for any reason. I'm not going to allege, allege that because that would make no sense. So, yeah, absolutely. Um, it seems like the merits of the candidates themselves. But I do think, you know, in a way that whoever whoever was going to be, you know, whether it was Rand's re-election or Plan's uh, election to the presidency, somebody's going to have to deal with this either way. Either somebody inherits it or somebody continues to, you know, weather the storm, so to speak, and deal with it. Uh, as far as escalating it to the accords themselves, I'm wondering if maybe, and this is just uh, me spitballing a thought out there, I'm wondering if maybe the Europea is wanting the other members of the accords to act as sort of mediators between the two, as opposed to just bilateral communication. Trilateral or even quadrilateral communication might uh, introduce, you know, a mediating benefit that it otherwise they might not. Uh, without being privy to those discussions, it's a bit. Uh, I can't. I can't say for sure why they would involve the accords as a whole. But maybe you know, if 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 it's a dispute between members, then maybe that is something that the accords needs to handle instead of just bilaterally uh, communicating. All right. So, some final points we've got uh, from our audience members, and then I'm going to go into our last little announcement before we end the broadcast here. Uh, it was it was confirmed by uh, you know it's Arcania about the espionage, about them of course attempting to open bilateral communication, but also how those areas are indeed protected, codified by law. So even the 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 debate about oh which areas are private versus they're not that's sort of a non-starter considering by codified law it's similar to how it works in TNP with uh, those areas being restricted. The areas are private, so leaking from them is unacceptable. That was a point of clarification issued by uh, Dark in our audience. And then Fiji also mentioned how, um, you know, I was talking about maybe the tactics of the situation uh, for the M- for the prosecution in the MJ case. It's He said it's maybe less tactics and more just matching a charge to the evidence. Like you were talking about, Scorch, if you, if you believe that you can prove that, if you believe you got the evidence to get that charge, then yeah, that, that'd be the appropriate one to go to. Maybe your evidence doesn't fit gross misconduct, and if that's the case, you you're wanna you want to go with the uh, charge that your evidence fits. Rightfully so, that's entirely reasonable. So yeah, I can totally I can totally see those. But I just wanted to acknowledge those points from our audience members live listening in that yes, these are all important considerations as the situation develops. Thank you for joining us um, here on MBS Radio today. It's been a fun broadcast. If you made it to this point, that's awesome. Uh, do the usual stuff, like and subscribe. I guess is that is that what the YouTubers say? I don't know, but yes. Thank you for being here, Scorch. Appreciate it. Yeah, no, no it was great. Thanks for uh, letting me on with you. <laughs>